Um, I'm Jeannie Braco. I'm a curator conservator. I work at Fort Lewis College. Um, I do a lot of training for students and interns who are interested in museum work, and that's the most fun part of my job. Um, this is Jack Towns. Jack Towns is an exhibit preparator and exhibit designer. He works out of Estacada, Oregon, but he works at uh, Fort Lewis for the Center of Southwest Study at the Wheelwright Museum with Sherry Doyle, who's over here, curator, and um, also at CU at the Avenir Museum. So he has a lot of experience with mount building um, and also with textile collections. Um, the talk we're going to do right now, um, Beyond the Box, um, using Coroplast for creative and cost-effective solutions and exhibit mounts, um, sort of came over seeing over the years many workshops on um, building a Coroplast box. And we do that. We build a lot of boxes at, at my museum, um, but we also use Coroplast in a lot of different ways. And so I thought it might be interesting to do a talk based on a material and the many uses for it. Um, so you can go look around your institutions um, and see places where maybe you've been working with materials that are more expensive or materials that are harder to get or materials that don't quite fit the bill and maybe Coroplast is a replacement, okay? Um, but there are many, many other materials out there and we'll go through a few of those. Um, I'm gonna start a little just with some general things about storage because while we use um, coroplast for storage, there are some concepts I'd like to get across. Can I start? We ready? Okay. Um, coroplast, well, first of all, what is it? If some of you haven't seen it yet at this meeting, have all of you seen or worked with coroplast? Yay. Yes? Yes, good, okay. And then there's the 10 mil, I won't pass that around because it's really heavy and um, I won't pass that around. Um, so anyway, um, some places have really Cadillac storage. Here's a good example. Um, and they may have all the money in the world. Some museums have rather modest storage, but they've stri they strive to make it very neat. This beautiful storage area, actually, probably an upscale from mid-range storage. I do a lot of surveys for uh, small historical societies. I'm not showing you their pictures. Um, but um, here's an example of some things that would benefit from storage but haven't even gotten that far yet. Um, so there are many different levels of sort of storage and what you're doing with your collections um, that you have to think about. So there are also other materials, as I mentioned. So there's coroplast um, as a sheet material, corrugated sheet material, and there's blue board. Um, then you have board material that isn't corrugated. I'm gonna show you some things and they're not actually made out of coroplast, and I may forget to say that, but it's an example of something where you have a box, it could be blue board, it could be coroplast, it could be some other kind of board material. Sometimes you're just looking for a box. Um, sometimes you're looking for the other properties. When we do storage projects, any kind of projects, exhibit projects, some things that are very important. First of all, prioritize. If you are the National Museum of the American Indian, how many artifacts did they say they had yesterday? 800,000 billion. Um, you are maybe not going to do a box for every artifact. Maybe you are. Maybe you have the funding to do it or you have a really big NEH grant. Um, so you have to decide what are we going to put into customized storage. Customized storage is not quick. Um, the other thing is divide and conquer. Um, I came into the small Fort Lewis collection, um, but small is 40,000 objects. And even after 15 years, not everyone is going to be in ideal storage. But every year we pick a part of the collection. One year we picked baskets, one year we picked beadwork, one year we picked the textile collection. Every year we try to pick a portion of the collection and upgrade the storage or the exhibit mounts. Develop and train a workforce. I cannot stress this enough. You do not want to make 40,000 boxes on your own, or non-boxes, or boxes with special inserts. Um, so do try to get help. Um, and I have, I am lucky at Fort Lewis, I have students who are required to come work with me for their GIS certificate. I have work study students. We take as many as the college gives us. Um, we do training sessions, um, but they're really inspirational in not only helping us through projects, but also having really fun and innovative ideas about projects. They think outside that box. 
And some of, my, some of my volunteers, some are seniors and some are actually middle school students. If you've ever worked with middle school boys, you will know you can work through a lot of objects at one time as long as you teach them about handling. So the properties of Choroplast that we really like, um, first of all, it's an archival material. It's polypropylene. The two plastics that we work with a lot in conservation or museums or archives work, library work, are polypropylene and polyethylene, two plastics considered inert. Polyethylene is more what the, um, we have some here, um, the thick ethofoam um, is, is made of, this more squishy stuff. It's pH neutral. It actually hardly has a pH reading at all. It's lightweight. It can be surface cleaned. This is very important if you'd like to reuse it. So it's also a recyclable material because we can use it in one exhibit mount. We can take it off. I actually put it in the dishwasher. So uh, just remember to put the flutes this way <laughs> when you put it in the dishwasher. I've washed it in the dishwasher. Um, it can be surface cleaned. It's easy to obtain. Almost any sign shop will sell Coraplast. Um, when we were in Alaska, we were even able to get sort of up, up for our workshop, we were able to get supplies up there, and they knew of a lot of places um, where they could buy Coraplast. Um, wasn't as inexpensive as it is here. Um, it's easy to work with. You can cut it. You can glue it. You can use a knife. Um, you can use some other cutters we're going to show you. It's fairly inexpensive, and it's resistant to water. To me, the water resistance is one of the best issues. Um, sometimes I'll choose to use Coraplast over blueboard, blueboard being the corrugated paper archival material, um, because I'm a little worried about what happens if we have moisture um, or something like that in storage. Um, so I really like the fact that it's water resistant. Um, one of the things you won't see in some of our um, images, I usually, in, in my storage area, when I use Coraplast, I do put a cotton sheet or I especially like there's a batting that's cotton on one side and nylon, sometimes polyester on the other. So I usually put a barrier sheet um, if it's long term between the coroplast and my objects. And because of kind of how I've done some of these photos, um, you won't see that in some of those. There's a lot of guides for you. Um, I didn't bring handouts with me, but you can go online. Working with polyethylene foam and fluted plastic sheet, this is a CCI, Canadian Conservation Institute handout, that you can download. So I just Googled CCI working with polyethylene foam. Um, I got it, and you will find many articles there that are useful. Um, another one will come up in this talk, and it's about um, using um, coroplast as backboards. I also um, went online, because what do you do when you're giving a talk? You go to Google, and I Googled Coraplast, and I found great stuff I didn't know about. And I was really embarrassed about the stuff I didn't know about. Um, but this is one of my favorite articles that I found, um, and it was very simple, cutting, gluing, um, using rivets, um, some really practical advice on working with Coraplast that if we were doing a hands-on workshop, we might be doing here today, um, but we're really doing more of a demonstration here. Um, so um, this was one of the illustrations I found online. It's actually uh, from the gentleman who did the CCI fluted materials handout. It's how to do a hot melt rivet um, to join two pieces of coroplast together. Now, You'll see in most of my images, I don't use hot glue, um, and it's a little bit of a personal perk, uh, personal issue. I had a student once who left the hot melt gun on top of the roll of microfoam on a Friday. Okay, so um, we, after that, we stopped using hot glue guns, um, and we stopped using a lot of the hot glue. We do a lot of fastener with twill tape. Um, I prefer that anyway, sort of as a textile conservator. Um, I really like those mechanical joints. We also use um, other types of fasteners. This is Jack. Here he is. Here he is. Um, he's, um, he can use a table saw. I'm not that good at that. Um, but we have a beautiful cutter. Now, this is the one cost effective. This has been cost effective. We purchased this. We have been using it for 15 years, and we have cut thousands and thousands and thousands of sheets of Coraplast. So if you are doing a lot of storage work or you have a grant coming up, buy one. I think this is called the Z3600, but um, we really like them. It's wall-mounted. Make sure someone wall-mounts it who knows how to get things straight. 
Um, this is a new tool we found online this week. I didn't know about the Coraclor, Coroclaw. We brought a couple with us. We tested them out yesterday. They work great. Um, so when you fold boxes, uh, for those of you, again, we're beyond the box, but when you fold boxes, you can score one side. Um, and we all, you know, we spend a lot of time training students how to score one side of the coroplast. <laughs> so if you get nothing else out of this workshop, if you've never used one, <laughs> this is probably uh, this valuable. We've only tried it on Marion Kamenitz's samples this size. <laughs> well, let's try it on the blue <laughs> That's what we tried it on. The tools are made for different thicknesses. So we bought the four mil, which does the quarter inch coroplast. Um, I have, a little too big for this one. yeah, I have one coming. <laughs> we'll do the first, demo now. Do the Sorry. first knot, there's two teeth here. Do the first one if you just want a fold, and do the second one if, if you want to cut all the way through. No straight edge. I love this. Nice. This thing's going to change my whole life. Anyway, we love that. <laughs> ah, um, I have the order information on the bag. It got shipped to the hotel. <laughs> so we have the company on it. Um, I have the 10 mil one is shipping to my lab. It wasn't Amazon Prime today. So um, those are coming later. But um, we're looking forward to trying them. And we think they'll be uh, much safer for our students to use. I should give everyone time to. You'll get to see them later, too. Um, so again, I'm going to go through just a few simple storage solutions. Again, the basic box. Um, this one isn't out of um, Coroplast, but again, you can do it out of board. You can do it out of Coroplast. You can do it out of blue board. Um, these are beautiful, very custom made entomology specimen cases. You can see that they have the dividers um, in both directions. They have little compartments, raised areas. A lot of custom work you can do um, to elaborate on the box concept. Some kachinas, um, these are from the Museum of Northern Arizona, and um, they have some um, beautiful um, ways of working with coroplast there. They tend to use a lot of um, sort of secondary supports to make it rigid. So they're using two layers here. And they use a lot of the Valara foam, um, to, which is a very soft foam um, to avoid abrasion in the storage system. Um, this is a system when you pull your drawers out, maybe your jewelry is sliding. So one of the things you can do is you can actually tie um, your materials to boards. That's very common. I know a lot of you probably do that already in your museums. Um, but sometimes we use blue board. Um, here we're using coroplast. One thing I wanted to point out, though, when you're doing storage like this for long, heavy objects, um, there is something I'm going to call plastic fatigue. Um, so what can happen, you have to make sure you're using the right thickness of coroplast. So if I'm mounting something heavy, even if it's just a carrying support, I might be using the 10 mil coroplast. This I'm going to use to sort of, as an example of a puzzle box you can do. The nice thing about coroplast, you could take a collection like this, which is sort of random shaped objects. And instead of cutting lots of long slips, long strips, you can actually do custom cuts and have sort of a puzzle drawer where everything fits in in a more uh, space economical fashion. This is from the School of Advanced Research. Um, Vinaya and Laura, have they both were working on a project there when they were interns. They've now moved on to other jobs. Um, but there we used a lot of coroplast, again, as supports. Um, there was a certain way we tried to use these as presentation mounts. Um, you could see, you usually see the rain stash the other way, but um, you could see these are the um, long ends that would come down. Um, you can see how we've tied the sashes on, but you can still see a lot of the structural features. Um, so it's a little bit consolidated storage instead of having things very flat. Um, here, too, in a box, we'll create a second shelf out of either coroplast or blueboard. We're using ethofoam on the side um, so that you can economize on space. And because coroplast has that strength, 
um, it's not going to sway as long as you don't put anything too hard on it. Um, this is a breastplate, um, and we wanted to make sure the neck piece stayed with it, um, so we mounted it above the piece um, in the box, so both are well supported. Um, and many of you have probably seen, if you went on the tour, um, both at the Hugam Center and at the Heard Museum, um, they're using, um, these happen to be blueboard, but they're using a lot of pottery supports where they take coroplast or blueboard and then they'll glue um, side supports into those boxes to hold up the pottery. There are some very beautiful ones we saw last night at the Cult Heritage Center. So I just wanted to summarize this before we go on to Jack's part of the talk, which is more about using coroplast in systems, um, storage systems, exhibit systems, um, uses for coroplast, rigid support boards, folder for flat storage, I haven't really shown you that, um, but some of the book handouts from CCI will talk about that, window map folder with a spacer, box fabricated from coroplast, compartmentalized box with vertical dividers, like with the entomology collection, box with coroplast shelves, um, that was one of the Hopi sashes in there, using as a shelf liner, you'll see that in the next storage slides, and then some custom supports. You want to yeah. So this is a basket collection that came into uh, one of the nations, purchased it. Uh, we were asked to come and help with the storage of this. And it arrived in cardboard boxes, just newsprints, and it was Pandora's box, basket inside of basket. And and they were wonderful. And as we started to see how many pieces were, we had our work cut out for us. So the nation decided they were gonna find us a good secure place to put all of these baskets uh, in their archives. It was a vault space, not very large, maybe this big. And we had access to a lot of shelving. And it was just metro racks that we got from their basement and vacuumed them all off and started assembling them. These are available from somebody like Sam's Club or Costco. And one section, like a back section, that would be, with wheels, would be $200 that you assemble. They're, they're $99. $99. $99. Okay, $99. Latest Sam's pr so, Club price. So think about this. This is. Uh, the most economical storage you will ever come up with. So there are all these individual pieces, and what we've done is here. Zip ties. These are just zip ties, wire ties, and we've assembled them all, wire tied them all together. So this is now, and the whole room is rigid. It's all one piece. Nothing's going to wobble, and we've taken the coroplast and cut long pieces, notch them up for the verticals, but run them full length and try to do as much overlapping between shelves. So nothing is sitting directly on the wire frames, which isn't good for your objects. Uh, it also makes for a nice bright interior because you're getting reflective on, on the top. And we started making boxes and purchasing boxes and puzzling this entire collection into this space. Do you vacuum the shelves and not just use like clogs, wipes, or? They, they had come from uh, an attorney's office from a big settlement they had done. And they had, all of the shelving came, and it was not there for very long. And we quickly grabbed it and <laughs> put it into storage. So this space here, You'll see blueboard boxes. Those are uh, garment boxes. Um, eventually, we moved much of this collection to Sherry's Museum, to the Wheelwright for an exhibit. And we transferred almost everything into coroplast boxes because you don't want to use the paper, the blueboard, or the, the yellow archival boxes for transport because they'll get dirty and you can't wipe off the bottom. And the coroplast is a much better if the, you have a little moisture when you're 
moving between your car or your truck, uh, it's a much better uh, product to be using for that. We actually, we wrapped the boxes in Tyvek as protection, um, so that also helped with dirt. But we knew when you use something that's a storage box and you also use it as a transport box, you know that it is going to get some wear and tear on it. And the Coroplast boxes hold up much better than the blue board. Some of the boxes we made, some of them were commercial boxes. You'll see like this and this. That's a top and a bottom. That's a lid. And we use the, the deeper ones for bigger baskets and the shallower ones for some of the plates. Um, getting as much mileage from whatever we get. Where do those things come from? Either University Products or, or Gaylord, one or the other. They had to do best bid. <laughs> so right. they bid them out. <laughs> and when after everything was put in, you know, we put plastic on. Um, we don't know what's really up in that ceiling of that building. Um, and not knowing that, not having access to uh, an as-built plan, you can only assume that there might be some water or you know, uh, high back up there. You don't know what's up there. So it's best they needed a dust cover because they're not closed. And it's protection against you're not there every day. You know, you're, and they had one. never used the storage room before, so, so we wanted to make sure they were protected. So this is some uh, painting storage at Fort Lewis. Um, these panels here, those are all coroplast. There were some dividers made out of uh, millimeter panels, but we could have easily made those out of uh, coroplast too, out of the 10 millimeter. So, Use that for the rigid fixed dividers, and then you can use the, the lighter stuff that we were painting, uh, passing around to use in between different prints and, and drawings that are in there that are framed. And what we've actually done here, this is shelving. This isn't painting storage, so this wasn't bin storage. But we added um, like aluminum door C-channel moldings. I'm not sure you like can. Like a, a U. Yeah, do you want to go show them where? So we added a molding that we screwed in sort of across the top and bottom of where those bins would be. So we basically converted a, a shelving unit into a paintings rack storage and using the Coroplast dividers. So we've, once again, we've used the Metro rack and we've put some in the middle there. You see some verticals. And those are the tracks that you would see to put those uh, adjustable shelves in where there's a metal blade. And we had access to some of those. We dropped them in. We wire tied those in. And those are going to be the vertical supports for these dividers. So here's the metal here. And it's wire tied with car plast up against it. And one of the issues about using the um, baker's racks for painting storage is you don't think of them as very sturdy side to side or back to back. But by adding the chloroplast, it made it very, very rigid. These are not going to go uh, you know, in any direction. And we wrapped, so there's a piece of chloroplast full wrap on, on the outer edges there. So there's. If there's a smaller piece that leans up against it, it's not going to fall out between the two posts. And that, that was a morning's work. That is not a big effort to do that. And uh, the rods, these rods here, pierce through the coroplast there. So it makes it really strong. You can use a fairly light piece of metal through, for your divider. Because as soon as you start backing it up with the coroplast, it becomes a very, very stiff unit. And this was, um, we basically we put the collection back in the same day we made the rack. And they've since used Tyvek to do all their paintings wrapping um, in that storage unit. So this is a book mount. And I don't know if anybody else has gone to maybe Rebecca's uh, workshop this morning. I think she was talking about book mounts. Everybody kind of gets to the same place eventually. But there is not really one way of doing any of this. You know, it, it does, one isn't wrong, 
uh, it's you're, you're achieving the same thing. So this is uh, a book mount for a very large portfolio. It's about 30 inches deep and opened up, it's probably about this wide. And what I've done is I've made a rectangle, two Vs, one being shallower than the other. So this is much deeper than this. And I've hot melt glued it because you'll see further on here that we're covering it all with fabric. So I didn't want to have wire ties showing and I didn't just do one seam with the uh, hot melt glue. I added gusket, gussets inside here. So there's really a lot of material and a lot of adhesive holding this all together. So that's it. You can see it's much thinner in the front. So when I put the, the wedge, which is here, and there's a, a slot cut in there, so it's going to fold. It's going to sit here. And those two little strips up there are going to run up against here and keep it from sliding forward. So the whole thing is just wrapped in fabric in a, a polyester double knit fabric. Um, at, this is at the Avenir Museum. And it's a fashion and merchandising program at CSU in Fort Collins. And everybody there is a wizard on a sewing machine. You know, I'm, I'm a, can, a mechanic on a sewing machine. I can sew straight lines. That, uh, but you could just say to one of the students that were in the program, this is what I need this to do. And it run off and it come back wrapped. <laughs> so, so it really achieved, you know, seeing the, that base is in here. And it's a ghost. You just and really, you see nothing. And that's a big portfolio. And getting that <laughs> angle, you really need to have work with two people and hold it and find the sweet spot where the page doesn't want to flip up and you're not putting too much stress on it. Sometimes you might put a piece of mylar that you'd wrap here. And you want to be able to change the pages every few weeks. Don't leave the same page up in a book like that. Because there are some newsprint cuttings from So this is a, a, so think of that, the book was this way. So we're going to take chloroplast and we're going to turn it this way. And the nice thing about doing this with chloroplast, this wasn't done with chloroplast. We reconfigured on another pro project like this. I would make the car plus go up, down, and back across, but I would do this to here, to here, make your seam down the middle. These are heavy. You can, you'd need to use 10 mil. It's a rifle on one side and a sword and a scabbard on the other. But it's, and you can use wire ties, the zip ties, to hold something like this on. I like to sew things on with monofilament or, um, or thread, something really light, but you can't do that with something like this. But this is a really uh, nice way to use coroplast because you could wrap it in fabric. You could make that triangle and cover it with a sleeve of fabric, push it in on the sides. Oh, sorry. We don't have no. the uh, finished finish mount on there, sorry. But, so think about this. We're going to move a couple more slides down of making triangles. This is a displays again. So this is the Wheelwright Museum. Uh, what we've done here is, this is a homosote board, which is a, a, a pH neutral uh, acoustic panel that's wrapped in fabric. This is an application that you could easily use with uh, coroplast because we're mounting necklaces on it, um, fabric wrapped once, once again. Um, the nice thing about fabric, it has a little tooth to it, and they, they don't slide. I don't like ma uh, mounting jewelry on slick surfaces. I like, also when I'm working on jewelry, I want to work flat. I, you know, this, is, this is approximately this wide. Uh, because what I like to do is I make forms, and there's a ring here, and I try to make them visually the same, that arc. You know, I might have two or three sizes, but they're all going to have that same look. And working flat on a core place 
panel, you can sew them through. You can use a, a, a jeweler's flex shaft with a really small bit and do that. Or you can just pierce it with, uh, you could use a hot needle to go through to. And that's the end result in a case. But that could easily be choroplast, fabric wrapped. This is at the Wheelwright Museum. And there was four oh, necklaces in that. So here's a, this is a choroplast panel. Did he, did he do student this Student project. This is a student, student project. project. <laughs> and you can see the used white thread on these uh, as opposed to monofilament. Um, actually, I should cl clarify. I don't use monofilament. I use fluorocarbon. Fluorocarbon is like several generations newer than uh, monofilament. It has a very soft hand. Like, I use like 12 to 14 to 16 pound test. A small roll like this big is about 12 bucks. And you want to keep it out of the light, leave it in its box, peel off what you need, keep it, always keep any of that in the dark because then it'll last indefinitely. If you leave it in the sun on your bench, it's going to start to, to break down. It's, you don't leave anything sewn on with monofilament on display for the next 10 years. It's, it's definitely a, a, I think of it as just temporary exhibit material. This is a, a really nice amount. You could easily do a mount like this with coroplast. You could do a cutout with it. Um, using lighter coroplast, sometimes if you don't have a saw or a jigsaw or even want to go there making a mount like this that where you need it to be stiff, you can easily cut it out of the four mil like that, laminate them, cross laminate them. If you make the flutes go in both directions, they become as rigid as this. So this is a painting that was, uh, had some conservation because it was dirty and it hadn't had any kind of backing on it. So if you have a, a painting or a sketch fabric that doesn't have a backing on it, it's going to work like a filter. The canvas will work like a filter and will get, and eventually you're going to, if you have a lot of air movement in a, a dirty location or a very long term uh, situation where it's been on display, you're going to have dirt on the on the canvas, and it might be coming through. So this is, next please. This is a, a backing on a, a stretcher. So picture the backing of, there's the stretcher, there's a crossbar on it, and coroplast has been added and screwed onto the back of it, and it helps to keep your canvas clean. If you're moving it around, if you're shipping it for an exhibit or handling it, it's a lot safer when you only have one surface to worry about, as opposed to both surfaces. And you can find it from CCI notes, and they'll give all the instructions on how to do that. I'll give you a minute to write. <laughs> Is that good? Did you get it? So back from the, the triangle that we were talking about, so here's a slant mount. Um, this is two panels. You can, you can easily make it out of multi different types of material. But when you're mounting a, a textile for display, these are two panels here. We can't get a panel five feet wide into our case at the wheelwright. So we split them in half so you can get them in, put them together. And we put Velcro across the top. Velcro on the textile, and it's up. And using coroplast, it's a lot easier to use a, a big panel. You can stiffen the backs of panels with coroplast to make panels like these. So this is at the Avenir Museum. These are these are NBA walls. They're temporary uh, walls that you can move around and, and configure any way you want. The decks 
are modular decks that are on wheels that they have. And we tied them all together with some, just a little bit of trim, but we're making like the giant version of that gun mount. This is all caroplast with just a triangle of wrap fabric stuffed in. This is a tube of polyester fleece, like your fleece jackets. Um, the nice thing about covering coroplast with that stuff is it's light, it's stiff. Um, when you're putting mounting fabric on it, these are samples uh, of Peruvian uh, textiles. There's enough tooth on that fabric that it doesn't want to slide. So you said fleece fabric? Yeah. Uh, I have some right here. This is polyester. This is the fleece we're using. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. So we can pass this around. This is a light like from, uh, from the fabric store. From the fabric yeah. store. You can comes in a lot of colors. It's washable. It's easy to work with. You can use a, a serger with it. It's great to use a serger on it. Uh, so the go back one, please. So the this is an outside wrap, one piece, okay, and then we've templated to make a triangle for the corner, make a piece, and we've wrapped it in fabric, just using electric staple gun, stapling it on, and then it's just a press fit into the ends. And once those triangles are put in there, that's really rigid, it's really stiff. Um, if you have a situation that you're worried about, uh, maybe it's in a larger case and you're, you're worried somebody's going to bump it, you can weight the inside, you can um, put like uh, steel shot in plastic bags, sew them into a little bag and put a lot of weight into that. So at the Avenir, this is the shop. <laughs> so if you're wondering why we're, bu we're building coroplast dividers and walls and stuff at that size. That's it. That's the shop. And this is what can happen the next day. <laughs> so the shop is now a snowdrift. And what do you do? So that's why we do everything by hand, essentially. So these are the larger slant boards. We're adding a little bit of backer here. That's just been hot melt glue. It's just strips of, of like one by two. Um, and Ryan is just a wizard at the staple gun and she's just banging these things out for me. And, but to get the big triangles that go in here, that's a fairly big commitment for a half a sheet of coroplast. So I just will always mock it up out of a piece of cardboard because cardboard I can, you know, doesn't cost much. And I don't want to mess it up. And, so I'll template that corner, I'll wrap it in fabric, just tape it on a little bit, and try it. So you can see this is the two pieces here, wrapped, and those little battens that are on the inside that are stiffening it. I'll take another piece of coroplast and put it between, and tack those, or put a couple of screws into it, and then it makes it really rigid. And there's a, oh. a little strip in it at the top after it's all together that I drop in there to tighten it all up, because we're putting three together there. Put the, the mannequin there. She's on a sheet of coroplast, because I don't want to walk on my new, nice new paint job. So we brought her in, sat her on a piece of coroplast, pushed her into place, and then slipped it out from underneath her. So for transporting, this is uh, a mountain lion taxidermy piece. Uh, that's the crate that it travels with. Uh, it gets, it's on a tray, it's tied down, it's in plastic, it's tied down onto the tray that we can lift it out. Um, to keep any extra movement going down, we're using these big poly polyester body pillows. And they're just really nice because they're not in contact with the lion's uh, hide but it's, they're really soft and you can scoot them in and it's better packing than anything we could really come up with very easily. And it really makes for a fast pack up.
So these, you can see the construction of the boxes. They're really just your small sort of individualized storage boxes just made much larger um, with the 10 mil coroplast. Yeah. If, when you're using zip ties, uh, in the first, the racks, you saw some white ones. If you have a choice, buy the black, because the black is not as light sensitive. Um, they, they, the lighter color, colored ones, any of the white plastics tend to be very use, UV sensitive. So always go for the black, there's a choice. And don't buy them from Harbor Freight. Don't buy them. They all come from China, right. but the stuff at Harbor Freight will get incredibly brittle fast. Spend a little bit more and buy some decent ones. Uh, but I really like them. My, my briefcase of all my little hand tools and awls and all of that stuff always has a bag of those in there. I don't go without them. Uh, so these are crates. This is for a big textile collection that we took out to the Fowler Museum in LA. Uh, this is how they were traveled. Uh, so there's a piece of ether foam across there that a sharpened can was used as the hole saw to make the holes. And then it was on this end, so the pipes will go in, settle down on this end, and then this piece slips in there and it's the top half. It's been, the row of holes are there, it's been split in half. Once the bottom one is adhered into the crate and you flip the top off of one so you can lift them out like this. So they're, they're rigid enough that they're sitting on two dollies. They're bigger than your six foot table. They're like from Sherry. Those are seven yeah, foot seven textile foot tubes in the crates. So they're on two dollies. Uh, we can stack them five high, six high, and they are really very stiff. We use some uh, polyester banding that's here. We put the banding on, we stretch wrap on top of the banding so it doesn't move around and people don't mess with it and you don't want them to pick it up by that banding. And there's more packing material in there than you saw when you just saw the textiles in the crate. So this is sort of the very next step when they're um, about, these were when they were unloaded. And this is a dedicated shipper, um, but this is how they travel. That's the mannequins from the show and all of the boxes for this entire exhibit. And it was just a joy to unpack. You know, we, there's no screws you know, for crates or anything else. They're light, you save a lot of money in your shipping. Um, you can make really like boxes on the right, those flat ones, if you make them big enough, put a, enough, maybe make a cavity pack, you could ship a painting that way. Um, it's far cheaper to build, instead of paying $250 or $300 for a crate that size, you can make one yourself way cheaper. This was our collection, uh, these textiles, about a $5 million shipment. So these went dedicated load. Um, but we have taken coroplast and we have made crates um, that we've sent to our donors so that they can send back their paintings. And we've done this through FedEx. We just put a lot more packing material in there and sometimes we'll do really a, like a crate within a crate, a double wall crate. Um, but it's really worked as a commercial shipment and it doesn't have, again, the same weight as a wooden crate, so um, we can just send it through FedEx. Um, our insurance policy insures through FedEx, but not through US mail uh, if, if we ship. And it's the donor's responsibility, so um, they're really, we're sending them a convenient crate, um, and the piece sort of until it gets to us is under their um, sort of purview, so. Do you think it could go through FedEx twice? Like Yes. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. Now, if you use the 10 mil for the sides on that, it makes a really nice package. And there's one thing we're starting to do now um, that you don't see on these crates, but we got tired of um, having to wear gloves, and you know, it's very sharp. The curve is very sharp. So um, we actually got some white duct tape, and on the way back, before we send everything back. 
Um, we have now um, duct taped all the seams. And remember, duct tape may not be archival, but you're using it on the outside of a shipping crate. Um, the one crate, when you said, can you use it again, um, we had a donor who was sending about 10 paintings. Um, they were all the same size to us. They were all framed. Um, so we just shipped them the crate for the first three, and then we just kept sending it back and forth. And there really wasn't any damage to the chloroplast. It's so sturdy and it's so rigid. Um, because we do those double flaps, I don't know if you can see in there, but um, sometimes we really make the flaps where you zip tie them, we make them bigger so that you can actually get like a double layer in there. But um, we've really um, feel like uh, we've, first of all, saved a lot of money not having someone have to construct wooden crates for us, but also we can handle them. Two of our staff, we can carry them to the truck um, if we're not rolling them out, whereas the other crates, we can't even move them in storage. And these crates, when they get back, we can take out all the zip ties and, and we can store and flat store sheet material. Flat. So there's a lot of reasons you know, to try to, in our institution where we're space short, um, to try to figure out a way to store 10 really big <laughs> textile crates. Uh, since we'd like to send them out all at once. There's something, some people call them pallet boxes, some people call them Kiva boxes. Oh yeah, we forgot those. When you've those. been <laughs> at the grocery store and you've seen watermelons for sale in those big, big totes, okay, you can buy coroplast ones. It's a tray bottom and a tray top um, with a coroplast interior. You can get them with locks that you snap lock uh, we toured Ben Nighthorse Campbell's jewelry exhibit that way. All the case furniture, all of the boxes went into those. The nice thing is you take the top off, you lay it down, you take the sides, this rectangle, take that off, and there you have all your, your, your pieces. You unload them, you're not digging into these things. They cost about $100 for one. All the, uh, the auto industry really developed these because they can take 16 loads, semi-loads of pallet boxes, empty them, and then they'll come back to the distributor in one truck. So it's, it's something that's being used over and over, the, the, plast, the coroplast ones. And I think it was how NMAI moved a lot of their collection. That's how they moved their collection from the Bronx, was in Kiva boxes like that. So <laughs> that's what we have for you in terms of you know, showing you some different ways to use Coroplast. And um, we'd love to take questions or if you want to hear more about some of the projects or you've done some projects and we can learn from your projects. Send them back if you're annoyed. Uh, we we <laughs> actually we yeah. we um, get them now. Um, we ordered them, so we're in Durango. Yeah. Durango, you know, we're kind of in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> Santa Fe, four hours. Denver, seven hours. Um, Supply one will deliver to us for ten dollars. So shipping sheets used to be part of the cost of buying them, but for us it's not an issue because so many sign making shops everywhere in the country use Coroplast. So you have a couple choices. You can call them and you can say to them before they ship, because we had the same problem. Yeah. We, actually, we had more of the problem with the gator foam um, than we did with the Coroplast. But you can say to them, you have to wrap my shipment oh. before you send it. And that really helps. And you also have to talk to them. Um, we sometimes go through um, Regal Plastics and sometimes they ship from their main warehouse and sometimes they're short and they get it from somewhere else and it can be soiled like that. So we won't accept those shipments. Okay. But it does help to ask them to wrap it before they ship it. They don't know what you're using it for. Yeah, so yeah. The sign outfits tend to ship them vertical in a truck. The archival companies that sell it to you like Regal P Piedmont Plastics out of Texas, which is a big distributor of acrylic sheeting, you know, plexiglass sheets. And they ship, ship flat, and the shipping is built on that four by eight sheet, floor to ceiling in the truck. 
So you're paying for the volume of the truck there. And if you're buying it from a sign outfit, they're ship, shipping it like plywood coat. You know, yeah. might be stacked up in it. And you pay less shipping. And they're distributing to all of these little shops that m they might be sending out 10 sheets to or five sheets. So they're, they're not gasping when you say you only want 10 sheets. <laughs> And the other thing is, so when I first got to Durango and before Supply One was in Albuquerque, um, we were actually going to the local sign company and we would put in our order with their order and then we would buy from them. They didn't really charge us, you know, additional, but um, so they were really nice. So we got the price break even though at the time we were only buying a few sheets. Uh, now we love it so much, we do so much stuff with Coroplast that we tend to buy like 24 sheets at a time. So we only have storage for about that many pieces, but. Do you have any problems with suppliers using an additive in the chloroplast or any kind of, just taking a workshop a couple weeks ago, we talked about flame retardant or anything yeah. like that? Yeah, you know, um, I did a lot, when Tyvek first came out, I did a lot of research and made a lot of phone calls about Tyvek because um, Tyvek was made, um, um, DuPont made Tyvek and you could call their science department and talk to the scientists who developed the coatings. Um, but they had different versions where you could get Tyvek with an anti-static, without an anti-static. I can't really figure that out quite with Coroplast. I did talk to um, um, the guy from Hollinger and I asked him about, um, you know, the difference because sometimes you'll see translucent and some, and yeah. it, a while ago if you bought Coroplast from an archival company like University Products or Hollinger, um, you would actually get it and it was translucent. We're using some of those in our workshop tomorrow. If we buy it from the sign company, it's always opaque. Um, and I've learned that it doesn't make any difference. Um, it's just whether they put in more filler. And remember, it's an extruded plastic, so it's kind of like polyester. It doesn't matter what color it is, it's, the dye's not going to run because it's extruded. So, you know, it's in there. In terms of is there anything on the outside, um, if you read through um, some of the articles on the internet, there's one article, and I think it's the second one I showed you, uh, it talked a lot about coatings. So um, there's nothing really on the coroplast, but that can be a problem because it's a slick extruded plastic surface. So sometimes they talk about how hard it is to tape it or how hard it is to paint it to glue it. You can actually tape it and paint it, and they do have advice for doing that, but the advice is like wipe it down with denatured alcohol because that must do a very little bit to dissolve the surface and, and then you can sort of use okay. tape with it. Yeah. Um, so I don't really, it's not like with Tyvek where they were producing a roll of Tyvek and in some of it they added the anti-static coating and in some of it they added the UV coating and things like that. With the Coroplast, it's just Coroplast. Um, but you can tell it if it's been cleaned before, if you put some water on it, if it stays in a very tight bead and just skates, okay, that's, if you really want it cleaned off, you can use alcohol to clean it. If, if it sheets, it, that's already, it's been treated somehow to uh, adjust, to deal with that surface. And that's what you'll see in that article. And the Coroplast company is actually called Coroplast. So if you go online and get to their website, you will see all of the um, statistics and product information on their website. It's really pretty interesting to go take a look at if you're into that kind of thing. <laughs> but so I'm pretty, you know, I've used the material now for a long time, pretty confident in it, like it. It's, I don't use it all the time, like Blueboard. We use Blueboard for some things. I don't know, sometimes I just get a feeling uh, this is, let's put in blue board. Um, sometimes there's an issue of not using plastics with certain Native American objects and certain objects that may have static. So sometimes we'll switch materials. But more often we'll take a coroplast box and then do a padded cotton liner um, for the artifact to directly rest on. So Is it sometimes cotton the, sheeting or yeah. whatever, some kind of a barrier. And one thing I always like to say in storage workshops, you know, we use a lot of acid-free tissue in museums. Cotton sheeting is just as good. <laughs> so a lot of times, um, you know, when we're doing storage, we hardly ever use tissue. We almost always use cotton sheeting. We'll either um, get it recycled, 
get it from the thrift store, wash it like crazy, or we'll get it from test fabrics and use it off the roll. So a lot of our coroplast mounts will have, as I said before, a cotton muslin type of interface on if them. If you have a connection to a nice hotel where they have nice sheets that they retire, that's what you want. If you can, because you get those nice, great big king sheets. That's what the Denver Art Museum did for a long time from the Brown Palace Hotel. Their collection storage was. Anyway, any other questions? Did I recognize that bow tie collection? <laughs> <laughs> that box of bow ties is. <laughs> that collection belongs to the wheel right now, but uh, I pulled a banker's box out in storage at this bank on a ladder, and I couldn't believe how heavy it was, and it stood this high, and the whole thing was bolos and Sunni jewelry that deep, and there were five boxes like that. So all of you can volunteer to do a storage project with Sherry. <laughs> it was the most astonishing thing when we opened it up. So, we came from a home world. There was a lot of smoking going on. And there was all in greasy little plastic bags where the bags were breaking down because they'd been in there a long time. And now it's all in car glass boxes and shelves. So it has a nice home. So we do, we just, um, I just brought a couple handouts. Um, the one, it's just the front page of the CCI handout in case you um, didn't write that down and want a reminder for that. So um, we have a lot of stuff here because we're doing the next session in this room. Um, so if you want, come back for how to build a mannequin. <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is our folding demo here. Oh, that's Coraplast. I guess we should say that, um, yeah, a lot of our um, mannequin working, mannequin workshop is choroplast mannequins and we didn't really include most of those in the PowerPoint because they'll be next up. Just to add, at the Denver Museum of Nature Science, they use these male and female screw connectors. Yes. Have you seen those? Yes. They're so cool. The nylon ones. Yeah. The I nylon guess. ones. I don't, yeah. and yeah. I don't know where they get them from, but they're so cool looking. Yeah. Well, you, I like the zip ties, though. That's the zip ties are nice. Accessible and uh, those screws, I wouldn't feel good about shipping those, sending oh, those yeah. on the road. Yeah, but no, but using them in house, they yeah. would be great. Those yeah. would be really great. And there's all kinds of auto body plastic parts for putting, like, the, you know, the, the inside covers of yeah. in the car and the wall panels. There, there are all kinds of plastic things that you set in, insert, you push it in another one and twist it, and those will all work with the, the bigger car plastic. Cool. But if you go to the hardware store where they have the little, little bins, like in a nice hardware mm -hmm. store, you can find all of the auto body part plastic parts, okay. and they will work with car plastic. Okay. Cool. Thank you so much. So for the zip ties, you know, so you got to make a hole for the zip ties using all, or what do you Yeah, just use an all. Um, some people use a hot implement. Other people will use uh, a drill. You can, a drill with a, a Forstner bit, if you have to drill some bigger holes. A uh, Forstner bit is, is it's like a, a little barrel there with not much of a spur on it, and it cuts a very, very clean hole to tear out on. You can probably set something.